If you'll take your Bibles with me and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. You know, a uh, pastor once told me, he said, Chuck, and I was a new first elder at the time. I was 25 years old. He said, I want you to try something. Uh, he said, if I do it, I might get into trouble, so I'd like to ask you to do it, and so forth. So I said, okay, uh, and so forth. So he said, I want you to read a different text than what's in the bulletin. And I want to find out how many people object. And there was about 160 people in the congregation. After we were finished, two people came up to me and said, I think you read the wrong text. Now we smile at that, but I will tell you something, is that, and we come to worship service, it is always a good idea to make sure whoever's speaking is quoting the right text, and so forth. So there is a lesson there somewhere, and so forth. So if you'll take your Bibles with me, a good introduction for that, and turn to chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, I'll be reading out of the New International Version, and it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. George. And a warm welcome to our, all our visitors as well. Oh, am I mute? Oh, okay. It's the wrong one. <laughs> All right. This week, um, I uh, celebrated my 20,440th day on this earth. Um, I, I kind of said it that way, so you have to do the math, but... One thing that I have learned over that period of time is that the next 365 days, you know, are going to be some good things, and then there's also going to be some trials and, and difficult things that will come. And over my 16,060th days of being a Christian, I have learned one thing, and I can testify to you this morning, that God is good all the time. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ has become the most beautiful thing to me. I am blessed because I know that as we sang today, I am loved, I am chosen, and I am a son of God. And those are powerful things to be able to take hold of, to have that knowledge. And that's what keep, the gospel keeps me going. And I hope that it keeps you going as well. So as I was thinking this morning what I was going to talk to you about, I started looking and I want us to look at the theme of a good soldier. The theme of a good soldier is uh, one of the items that we are going to talk about today. And the Bible uses this illustration of a soldier in warfare and battles and a race and a fight. It uses that because it wants to teach us some spiritual truths that will help shape our Christian experience. And those are the things I want to explore with you this morning. So let us bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, our, our God, holy and worthy are you, Lord, to receive our praise and our worship this morning. We invite, Father, your presence to be with us here this morning. 
Please come, Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit. Fill every heart that is here. Fill us with your peace. Give us your knowledge, Lord. Help us open our minds. Lord, I am nothing, um, but Lord, you can use me. And so I just pray that you would take my lips, use my words, uh, that I might be an instrument in your hands. Lord, pray that you would speak through me and to me. And may Jesus be uplifted in everything I say today. And Lord, uh, we just acknowledge you as our creator and redeemer, our captain and our guide in um, spiritual warfare that we deal with every day. And so, Father, we just pray that uh, you would give us the peace and assurance this morning uh, of your love and your grace is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Webster defines a good soldier as someone who uh, joins the army. The qualifications of a good soldier, according to the U.S. government, is one that includes reliability, fearlessness, discipline, consistency, courage, motivation, and skill. Good soldiers must be prepared to exceed their abilities, be diligent in getting tasks completed, and stay focused on safety. I know that in our, this congregation we're blessed because we have um, members and people, and also we have sons and daughters that have served in the U.S. military. Um, and I know I have with me today a friend who came, uh, Kevin Tierney, a good friend of mine. He served in the U.S. Navy for 22 years, and I'm glad that Kevin is here, and he came because I told him that uh, when he came to church um, that I was going to be preaching. Uh, and so he said, well, if you preach, I'll, I'll come. So I'm glad that Kevin is here. Uh, I'm delighted for that. So I hope to uh, do you proud today. Um, it is undeniable that as Christians, we live in a battlefield. A war that started in heaven, but the battle happens here. We are in the front lines of the war. And Paul uses the metaphor of a soldier to teach us some spiritual truths as he was relaying to Timothy. And these are the last words that Paul relates to Timothy. He, Paul is at the end of his life, and as Chuck read for us in 2 Timothy 4, 7, verse 8, he's telling the young minister to be strong, but he's kind of giving him a synopsis, and he says, as Paul had been a good soldier, he said, you know what, I have fought the the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award for me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. This morning, as we will be looking at this, is going to be Paul's message to Timothy. In 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to them. And we're going to read, starting in verse 3 and 4. And we're going to read, it says, You therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. There are going to be five qualities that make up a good soldier, according to Paul. And we're going to break those down this morning. In the military, not everyone who joins the Marines gets to be a Marine. They go through a very arduous process. And Paul tells Timothy here, you were chosen. You were chosen. The last part of verse 4 says, you were chosen to be a soldier. The word chosen is like well, how we use that we are called, called to service. So the first quality of a good soldier is to answer the call. If you are called, will you answer the call? There is nothing more dishonorable than a man who puts on a uniform and when the time of battle comes, he turns around and doesn't want to go to war. You are considered a coward in the military if you did that. You have dishonored yourself and the code. What is your response this morning to 
the call of being a soldier? Would you answer the call? In 1914, Sir Edward Ernest Shackleton uh, was getting ready for his Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. And he put this ad uh, in the paper. Now it's debated in some whether he actually did it or not. But the ad goes like this. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, Honor and recognition in case of success. Quite an advertisement, right? But many did answer the call. But not all of them were selected. Only a few were selected. But men wanted to, to join in, into this cause. They wanted to live life on the edge. I remember the uh, advertisement of the Marines, and I think it's still, it's the few Right? It's not for everyone. It's the few, the proud, the Marines. That is the mindset. The mindset is it's of a few. So Jesus gives us this, this call to be a good soldier. He is calling us, and the question in this morning is, how will we answer the call? In Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 58, uh, one of uh, Jesus' uh, followers came to him. And Jesus answered him, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the airs have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you say you want to follow me, but I don't even have a place to rest my head. Animals will fare far better than you if you uh, if you follow me. We must answer the call. We have been chosen by Jesus, and the question is, again, the call for discipleship, how will we answer that call? You are called to be a soldier of Christ. In the Christian realm, many have laid down their lives for the Word of God. Many saints went and hid in caves and, and wrote down under candlelight uh, the Bible. Many individuals were burnt at the stake because of the Word of God. Really? <laughs> it's a belated birthday now. <laughs> but Christ, Christ's Word is so, was so precious that many gave their lives for it. One of the other things that um, the verse says is that you therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. To endure hardness. That is another uh, quality of a good soldier is that if you're a good soldier, you will endure hardness. There is a, uh, a documentary that uh, I saw about Army Rangers and what they have to go through. So for eight weeks, uh, process, it's very stressful. Um, they go and uh, they were doing this documentary and out of 300 uh, men who wanted to be Rangers, only 90 kind of went through and finished the last round. It was physically exhausting. They go through it. None of them went in thinking it was going to be an easy task. They had to endure hardness as a soldier. And there's a story told of early Christians meeting uh, in uh, Rome during the early Roman uh, Empire. There were 40 men who were worshiping. They were worshiping uh, in a house secretly. And a centurion found out that they were worshiping, so they gathered them, soldiers gathered them and took them down, and they said, what should we do with them? And he said, uh, take them down to the river, build a fire on the edge of the river, and then have them take their clothes off and go into the river. So they did that. They took the men who were worshiping Jesus, took them down to the river in the middle of winter, had them stripped of their clothes, go into the river. And the centurion said, there's a fire here. So if you renounce Jesus and accept, Jesus, and accept Caesar as your Lord, then you can come out and warm yourself. 
So the men shivered into the water. They got close together to just try to keep warm. And one of them started singing, Forty men of Christ are we. Faithful forever we shall be. Forty men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. Forty men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. And they just kept saying that over and over and over as they shivered there in the water. Then suddenly, one man broke ranks, came out of the water, and he went to the centurion, went before him, and he says, I renounce Jesus, and I accept Caesar. So they brought him a blanket, led him to the fire. Centurion goes out to the men. Anyone else? The men were shocked that this had happened. They were silent. And then one started. 39 men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. 39 men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. And they sang for hours. Louder and louder. To the point where the governor heard the noise and the ruck. And he came out to see what was going on. He got dressed. Went out to the river talked to the centurion and said, what is, what is going on? So the centurion explains to him what had taken place. It was illegal to worship anyone but Caesar. So here were these Christians that they had found, so they, he explained it to him. So he stood there watching the men as they shivered in the cold, huddled together. 39, 39 men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. Thirty-nine men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. And they sang and they, for hours doing that. All of a sudden, the governor starts taking off his clothes. And he goes into the water. And as the men are singing, Thirty-nine men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. He tells them, No. Forty men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. It was what he saw, their faithful endurance, it convinced him to give up Caesar and accept Jesus as Lord. So the second quality of a good soldier is to endure hardness. Life will not be easy. The Christian experience is not easy. The third quality is found in the first part of 2 Timothy 2.4, which it says, No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. But no man that wars... So in other words, does it say that we go to war? Yes or no? Do we go to war? Yes. It says no man that wars. He is expecting that you as a soldier of Christ will go to war that we will be involved in the warfare. But this warfare is not a warfare that we engage in with guns and knives and things of that sort. This is a spiritual warfare. This is a warfare, and this is evangelism. Sharing what we have with Jesus, sharing our experience, that's what it means to be a good soldier. The third quality is that we will be active, in active duty. To engage in the battle of saving souls when we are sharing what Christ is doing in us, for us, and around us. When we minister to others, encouraging, uplifting them, engaging with them, and caring for them. That's how we grow when we share Jesus. Not only to just keep them, if we keep it just to ourselves, that experience is not one that is one of growth. If we come to church only on Sabbath and we pray only here, I can tell you from experience that that, that will not grow your, your, your Christian experience. You will spiritually die if you do that. If you don't have a daily relationship and a daily walk with Jesus, 
that you're constantly conning on him and, and talking with him and praying with him, you will die. You will not survive. If you're depending on the quality of the speaker, God have mercy. <laughs> I'm not a very good speaker. If you're relying on the preacher, you're putting your hope in something that's not right. You will spiritually die. Many young people sometimes will say, Where, how come we don't see the miracles? Why don't, how come we don't see you know, the things that we read in the Bible? Why don't we, how come we don't see that? And it's perhaps because we're not engaged in the warfare and in the battle. Because we're not active. I know that many who have done culporting, and I know that those who have culported, when you're active in ministry, you see God working. God does things. And you're not alone. So the third quality of a good soldier is to be active. We go to war. To be active. Zechariah 4.6 says, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord of, to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and, blood, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what we battle. That's what we war against. War against self. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Second Corinthians 10.4 These are great, precious promises that we can hold on to. The fourth quality of a good soldier is that it says, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. To entangle oneself in the affairs of this life. In this life, we have to be involved with the affairs of this life. We have things that we have to do. That's just normal. That's just part of life. But the Word says that we should not be entangled. We have you know, school, we have work, we have all these different things. But it says that we should not be entangled or, in, or bound by them. In other words, the things of this life should not so dominate us or bind us they are consumed with them, and that we have no time for God. The things of this world should not bind us so that we don't have time for the things of another world. When a soldier is at war, or he goes out on a mission, I don't think that a soldier would be checking, taking out his phone and checking his Facebook status or whatever, or be texting right? When you're at war and you're out in the battle and you're on the mission, you're focused. Everything is all consuming. You're just focused on that. When um, I was uh, with Kevin, Kevin and I went camping uh, uh, last, last year in, uh, in November, we went camping. And when we were camping, he shared with me a book uh, from the military that he used to make his soldiers, his you know, people that were under him, read. And as I did some research on the book and I read it, um, and, and as I read it, it's, it's called A Message to Garcia. Um, it is required reading in, in some, uh, still in, in some divisions of the, uh, uh, of the armed forces. How many of you have read that book? Have you ever read A Message to Garcia? I see any hands? Okay. It was written in 1899. It was an essay by Albert Hubbard. And in it, it's entitled A Message to Garcia, it expressed the value of individual initiative and conscientiousness in work. As its primary example, the essay used, uh, uses and dramatizes the version of a daring escape performed by an American soldier, First Lieutenant Andrew S. Rowan, just prior to the Spanish-American War. The essay describes Rowan carrying a message from President William McKinley to General Calexico, uh, Calexico Garcia, a leader of the Cuban insurgency, 
somewhere in the mountain vastness of Cuba. No one knew where. The essay contains Rowan's self-driven effort against the imbecility of the average man, the inability or unwillingness to concentrate on a thing and do it. In the message to Garcia, one of the quotes says this, the point I wish to make is this. McKinley gave Rowan a letter to be delivered to Garcia. Rowan took that letter and did not ask, where is he at? By the eternal, there is a man whose form should be cast in deathless bronze and a statue placed in every college of the land. It is no book learning young men need, nor instruction about this and that, but a stiffening of the vertebrae which will cause them to be loyal to a trust, to act promptly, concentrate their energies, do the thing, carry a message to Garcia. And so this story uh, took on uh, you know, propor proportions. It was duplicated a lot. A lot of people uh, you know, use the story. The, our military still uses it today. To inspire men to take initiative. Someone asks you to do something, you do it, right? So it was trying to teach them uh, that initiative. And as I read the story, one of the things that um, I relate to it is that we have a message to deliver. We also have a message to deliver. Not to Garcia, a general, but a message that is of far more importance, a message to the world. We have been given that message, a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ of the power he has to save. That is the message that we can carry to the world. With singular focus to not to be distracted by the things of this world. If we don't make time to study God's word and if we don't make time to be intentional about sharing God's word, then we won't do it. So the fourth quality was not to be entangled, but to be focused. So here's a picture. I don't think it's historically accurate. I think it's just put on there. But the Spartans, another uh, group that was famous for war. Um, they made a movie, you know, the movie 300, right? Um, uh, that was about Spartans. And Spartans are unique because Spartan society was, they would, from birth, if you were looked at and you were kind of scrawny, uh, you were put out. You would not uh, survive. You were left out to uh, the wild animals if they thought that you weren't able. Their whole society was based on war and warfare, and they valued it a lot. So much so that mothers would give, uh, give their sons their shields with the words, return with it, or carried on it. In other words, that is to say, be victorious or dead. Since in battle, that heavy shield that the Spartans would, would, would wear would be the first thing the soldier would be tempted to put down and leave behind. But dropping the shield was the synonym for desertion in the field. So they wouldn't do it. Leonidas, the famous king uh, of the city-state of Sparta, when the Persians were coming in 480 BC, they came to the, this battle of uh, Thermo, I don't even know how to say it, Ther Thermopylae or something like that. So they went to this battle, and when he, he thought that he would funnel them through between these, these two places, and, and so they, they, they stood there, and he had 300, 300 uh, soldiers from Sparta, some Greeks, and some, from some other groups that were there as well. And they blocked off the first advances that were made, but then there was another advance that came around the, the sides, and they weren't able to hold them off. So he knew that he was being outflanked, and so he sent some of them home, and only the Spartans stayed back, 300, to hold them off as long as they could. And there was a as they were getting ready for battle, 
There's a story told of a wafer that was passing by, and the stranger, he said, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Sparta. And so it's said that Leonidas looked at him, and he said to the stranger, he goes, go back. To, when you go back, he says, tell them that we have fought as Spartans that we have kept the law, that we have been faithful. And the most honorable way to die as a soldier for them was to die on the battlefield, to give their life in service. I don't know, for me, uh, this is an inscription from uh, one of the, uh, an epitaph. It says, go tell the Spartans, thou that passes by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. We know that we are, we'll, there'll be a time of trouble that um, will come. And I don't know what the Lord's plans are for my life, but I would like to think that I would like to be faithful so that I can say, Tell Jesus, I have behaved the way he wanted me, wished wished, wished me to behave, and I'm buried here, and I have given my life for his service. I want to be faithful to Jesus. And the fifth part of 2 Timothy 4, it says that he may please him who has chosen him. That he may please him who has chosen him. The final quality of a good soldier is aim is to please Jesus. As Paul is wrapping, putting all this together for him, he says it's all about Jesus. That's the whole reason we do what we do. As a good soldier for Christ, we acknowledge that he has chosen us and we want to please him. The Marines, when they go through their training, the last piece that they do before they become a Marine is they have to first pass what's called the crucible. And the crucible, it's a 40-mile 40, 40 uh, hike or a couple of days with limited food. So for three days, they, they, do, they do this, and they have just uh, rations for three MREs for, for three meals. They sleep for only two hours uh, during that period of time. So it's very grueling, challenging them physically, mentally, and even morally. And only those who make it through earn the title to be called Marines. Many break down and cry when they go through that process, when they finally make it through. There's a ritual when they come through, and when they come in, it's the morning, it's dawn by the time they make it back. And there, there's a general, and uh, their uh, sergeant and commanders are there to welcome those who have made it. Those who make it through, they get pinned. And for the first time, they are called Marines. So their sergeant will come, place a rank on them, salute them, and say, good morning, Marine. For the first time they hear those words, many of these hardened men break down and cry. They cry because of their experience that they have gone through. They know how how difficult it's been, and they have made it. But unlike this, the military example that I'm relaying to you right now, there is a prevailing truth that we hold that is a little bit different. And that is this. 2 Timothy 4.18, Paul con- continuing on um, in his letter to Timothy, says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
we will not be able to stand and take the credit like these soldiers, the Marines do. They do it through willpower and everything else. But for the Christian soldier, it's not like that. For this Christian experience, it's very different. For the Christian experience, it is the Lord who gets the credit. It is the Lord who gets us through it. And that's what Paul is saying here. Revelation 12.10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. The results of the war, the war that we wage are known. Jesus has already won. Our victory is assured. Satan is a defeated foe. We are sons and daughters of God. We need to start believing it, living it. We are free. We are no longer bound by sin. That is the good news of the gospel. And that is where the analogy of the soldier kind of breaks down. There's a story told of a massive elephant who was being held in place by a small stake and a rope that was obviously too small to hold him. A tourist marveled at the fact that the elephant felt trapped and wouldn't go beyond the boundaries. Until the trainer explained to him, he said, I started with the stake when he was a calf, and it held him. He became so used to it that he still thinks it will hold him. He doesn't even try. It is time to try the rope. It has already been broken by the same force that broke the bonds of the death for Jesus. What's holding you back? Are you even not trying? Are we not living our lives in a way that we know that we are sons and daughters of God? Are we being held back because of the lies that Satan says about us? Are we being like the elephant, constrained, used to being in that, in that area? Jesus will one day meet us. At the end of it all, Jesus will meet us. And he will greet every one of us as his soldiers. As he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. I long for those words where Jesus will come and he'll say, John, well done. Well done, my faithful servant. Nick, well done. Well done, my faithful servant. You will reign with me, and he will take a crown and place it on your head and say, good morning, your majesty, because we will be kings with him. What a day that will be. There will be tears as we will recall how he has made it all possible. He chose us. He molded us. He loved us. And we will see and we will remember that we were not faithful, that we let him down. That the times that we thought we, we weren't tough enough, we fell. But there, Jesus will say otherwise. Jesus will say, You have been faithful. And you'll know in your mind that you have not been faithful. But Jesus in front of God and the unfallen angels will declare to you that you have been faithful. The reason we are here is because of you, Jesus. Jesus has been the faithful one. And I think they'll say, crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He will have the name that is above every other name. So my appeal this morning to you is quite simple. 
This morning, do you want to be a good soldier for Christ? Do you want to be a good soldier? The qualities of a good soldier. We will endure hardness. But are you willing to endure hardness? Will you answer the call? Are you willing not to be entangled with the things of this world? And finally, do all to serve Jesus who made it all possible. If this is your desire this morning, I just ask that you would stand with me as we pray. Father God, we come before you thanking you for who you say that we are. And Lord, we just want to come and we want to be good soldiers for you. But we acknowledge, Lord, that we are weak and we need your power and your strength. But this morning, Lord, we also rejoice and give glory to your name because you have won the victory and you have provided the weight for the fortresses and the walls to come down because you have won. And Lord, we just want to hold on to that power and be faithful to you. We pray, Father, that you would be with us, that you would strengthen our decisions to um, follow you, to please you, to answer the call that you have given us to be your servants. Lord, we thank you and pray that you would seal our decisions until you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.